Our next speaker is Dr. Christy Bingham, an adjunct professor at California State University Northridge and restoration ecologist for the National Park Service's Santa Monica Mountains Restoration Area, Recreation Area. Uh, she'll be discussing the, the challenges that Santa Monica Mountains Recreation Area, uh, America's largest urban national park, uh, has in balancing the needs of both recreational activities as well as the environmental and ecological demands of the park. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Christy Brigham. Thanks everybody for coming and taking this time to think about restoration and where we're going from here. Um, I'm going to talk about several things today uh, that will reemphasize many of Bruce's points about where we are now in the field um, in the provincial stage. Um, and I just want to thank you guys for coming and for inviting me. I'm really pleased to be here. So this is mainly going to be an exercise in storytelling. I'm a big fan of storytelling. There are, just to warn you, some data slides in here that I won't dwell too much on, but just prepare yourself. There are graphs. Um, I want to start with two stories um, from our park uh, that sort of set the stage of where we are. So um, in the first story is called Where Would You Hide the Body? and is about the um, how we even have a restoration ecologist at Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. So um, this is Zuma Lagoon, which uh, the initial planning started in 1993 because at the request of the LA County Sheriff and um, others, because this area was all invaded with a rundo donax, and uh, they, a dead body showed up there. And they decided, oh my gosh, we can't have this this way anymore. Um, why don't you change it and make it unlikely to hold dead bodies anymore? Um, <laughs> which is not how you normally think of or conceptualize the beginning of an ecological restoration project. Uh, but inspiration can come from many places. So um, this is actually owned by LA Beaches and Harbors. They're not uh, known for their ecological restoration prowess. Uh, neither were we at the time, but they asked us, um, hey, can you help us figure this out? And at the time, the park didn't have a restoration ecologist. Like Bruce said, m most of us were trained as plant ecologists. My predecessor, the plant ecologist, um, they worked with a landscape designer. They had this insane plant palette that had like 250 different species, 30 different micro communities. It was very elaborate. The drawings are amazing and beautiful. Um, and the whole impetus was because they didn't want people to get murdered and buried here. Um, this is what it looks like now. Uh, it's actually dominated by about 15 species. There's really only two sort of habitats, a very salty area um, down close to the lagoon and more of an upland area, uh, which is also, I think, um, illustrates one of Bruce's points that it doesn't have to be perfect. I think we start off with a lot of really fancy plans because we like plants and we're super interested and we like things to be fancy. Um, but nature is a very strong filter and sort of sorts out the wheat from the chaff in rapid order. Um, so that's where we came from and this is where we th I think we're going. Um, this is a very quirky talk that's very um, much comes from where we are near LA. Uh, there's an, a huge uh, initiative in LA called LA 2050 that's talking about how to make Los Angeles better in 2050 uh, and they have five indicators three of which I think are really relevant to ecological restoration, especially in an urban context. And those are health, environmental quality, and education, all of which could be served by implementing urban restoration projects in LA. Um, and if you've been there, it's really hideous. I mean, I love LA. There's so much going on culturally. But from a nature perspective, there's so much that could be better. There's so much pavement and so little green space, and it's very, um, anyway, so that's where I think we're going. Um, there's 600,000 kids in LA that don't have access to parks, and there's nothing that, nothing that says that those parks have to be grass and a basketball hoop. Um, plenty of those parks could, be, could have native habitat, could be places where you could see California towies, and pick up your first western fence lizard and start to learn about what your ecological and biological heritage is, what belongs to you, what those plants and animals that are supposed to be there are. Um, so those are sort of the things that we're looking forward 
thinking about for restoration in our little provincial yet urban area, um, can we make LA permeable to wildlife? And that's a huge issue for us with climate change, even with current populations. We only have nine mountain lions in the Santa Monica Mountains, maybe 12 at the outset. That's not enough. If they can't get across the Simi Valley and get across LA, we won't be able to preserve the biodiversity that we're supposed to protect. Um, and the last point on there is I think um, we tend to be our own harshest critics and we're super picky, like we want everything to be perfect. Uh, and really I think the success of a lot of projects depends on the context. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, I toured like 40 wetland restoration sites in western Washington. There was a huge impetus there about restoring wetlands because we were filling them all in to build mini malls and all this stuff. Um, and they were all terrible. They were all like these horrible little, somewhere just like dug out with a backhoe and there's like one mallard in there and some cattails. Um, and I think by any measure, they, they sucked. Um, but we went to this one in Tacoma, Washington that used to be the city dump. Um, I'm fond of dumps. The Zuma Lagoon was actually a Caltrans dump before we restored it. So they make the best restoration sites. Um, and it was still kind of like a marginal cattail swamp. Um, I think botanically no one would get very excited there. But there were kingfishers there, there were great blue herons there, there were night herons there, there were yellow rump warblers. Because if you're in Tacoma and you're a great blue heron, you're not picky. You know, it's like the only wetland within a hundred mile radius of pavement that you're trying to fly through. So we have to not be so harsh on ourselves and think about the context and that sometimes these small projects that from if you were able, if you were going to look at nutrient cycling and is the biodiversity what it should be in some primordial western Washington swamp, it's not going to measure up. But from the urban uh, great blue heron and toddler and little kid and your next door neighbor's perspective, it's plenty good enough. Okay, so I'm going to just, because this is very based in my experience, I'm going to tell you a little bit about where I work first, the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. The heart of the talk is going to be number three, talking about um, three or four, maybe five examples of restoration projects that we've done, very small scale, what we've learned, what we haven't learned, and then fall, fall, finishing up by some of these bigger picture issues. So um, this is the park. It ends in Griffith Park and goes from Point Magoo to Griffith Park. So we're sort of up here off to the northwest of the park right now. Uh, very similar to the habitats that are here, mainly chaparral, coastal sage scrub. Um, based on our new veg map, we call everything sumacral because laurel sumac's everywhere. Um, we have some native oak savanna and grassland reverence and riparian systems. It's crazy. Uh, there's 120,000 acres um, within the boundary, but only half of it's publicly owned. So it's this big mix of privately owned and publicly owned land. Within that, the Park Service only owns uh, 23,000 acres. We have a bunch of issues. That's how we talk about problems in the government. You're not supposed to have problems. You only have issues. So our issues include invasive species. There's a ton of invasive species. Um, there are some threatened and endangered species that we're trying to manage specifically for. There's a ton of urbanization which introduces fragmentation, nitrogen deposition, anticoagulant rodenticides. Uh, people like to kill rattlesnakes, which is unfortunate. Um, there's a lot of crazy past land use, old vineyards that totally failed, weird apple orchards that totally failed, a long history of quirky enterprises that totally failed. Um, there, but it's still very biologically diverse. Most of the talks I give, I spend the first half trying to convince people how super cool Mediterranean ecosystems are. I feel like if you take anyone and plot them down in the High Sierra, pretty much everyone thinks it's super awesome and should be a national park, but if you put them down in the midst of Chaparral, they just want to leave. Um, so I spent a lot of time talking about how awesome the Chaparral is, even though we don't have trees that there's still lots of plant diversity and neat animals. And if you would just get down on your knees after a good rain, you'd see like 50 different species that are all this big and have amazing flowers and all these associated insects and how cool it is. So you, there's a sort of appreciation gap that you got to get over for the Santa Monica Mountains. Um, and then we're, we're the Park Service. We're charged with protecting resources unimpaired for future generations. So that's a pretty high bar when you don't even know what's there to begin with. 
this is what it looks like. There are some places, when I moved here, I grew up in Washington State. No one from Washington moves to California. I'm like the pariah of my family. Uh, you're supposed to, only Californians move to Washington. Uh, the weather is way better here, but there's a lot more people, and so, you know, there you go. Um, no one believed, everybody thought, oh, it's all paved, but you know it's not all paved. And so there are places in the park that look like this, where you actually can't see another house, um, you feel like you're in the middle of nowhere. We take fifth graders out into the park all the time, and they say, I've never been anywhere this wild before. I've never been this far out in nature. Um, and, but there's also a lot of edge. Uh, we have a lot of invasive species. The flora is about 1,200 species, about 300 which are non-native. 20 to 25 we consider majorly invasive that cause ecological change. This is the map. Um, approximately, it changes all the time. But there's over 4,000 infestations of about 19 species. Most of them are small in size, but they're distributed all over the landscape. Okay, I already talked about that. Um, what am I interested in? What am I concerned about? Uh, we have a bunch of questions in invasion biology that have to do with have we really correctly identified the threats. Um, when I started, the whole restoration, well, there was no restoration program. Then we got the dead body, and then we changed the aquatic ecologist into a restoration ecologist. And then it was me and one other guy. And we had 4,000 infestations and all this, you know. So the prioritization is a big key to dealing with these kind of problems. So we need to know things like, are, have we correctly identified the invasive species? How can we be maximally effective? Um, what are potential new invaders? There's a lot of links between nutrient dynamics and invasions. So we look at all those things, mainly with interns and criminals. Um, then, which I'll talk about a little bit later, um, restoration ecology. So we're trying not to just kill weeds, but also restore systems. Uh, this friend of mine, Joe Kitts, who works for Mountains Restoration Trust and is an amazing botanist, every, I swear, she does all these projects where they go in and maybe she'll carefully spritz some Roundup or else she and like five other people will hand pull a bunch of weeds. And then and miraculously, it's all better. And there's like all these natives under there, and it's like this amazing system. Those, that's not where we work. That never happened. Anyway, so you'll see that weeding alone is not, not the answer for us. Um, we're specifically interested in both what, are, what do we need to do for specific species of concern, and then try, we've tried a bunch of different techniques to get back function and diversity in different systems. Um, we've had a lot of things that didn't work, which I will hopefully tell somewhat amusing stories of some of those. Um, and we're definitely still in the phase of working at a very small scale in a very particular system. So what, are, what stories today? So nothing, you know, this is not, if you, and I'm sure you knew there wasn't going to be anything earth shattering, but just to confirm, there's no earth shattering results in, in the next portion. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, a a project we did where um, absurdly high diversity plots function the best. Uh, we also have um, this issue where you remove one invasive species and you just get another and another and another, and that it's very hard to break that cycle. Um, we've done a lot of studies showing that different invasive species are reducing biodiversity to different amounts, but they're all, all the target species that we're working on do completely reduce native biodiversity. They keep out all native plants, and there's only a small subset of insects that persist on them. Um, and then I'm going to talk about a particular study that we did looking at um, the impacts of invasive species and restoration techniques on a little tiny um, aster that's federally endangered. And then uh, I'm not going to talk today about comparisons that we did of the 19 invasives that we have and their different impacts on native systems. And then I'll talk at the end about um, some scaling up issues that we've had. OK, an absurd amount of diversity. So um, this, there's no reference site. So Bruce talked about reference conditions. We have no idea what this site should look like. Um, maybe riparian, maybe grassland, maybe coastal sage scrub, maybe oak woodland, hard to say. Um, it's changed a lot since whatever it used to be. Uh, it's actually an old filming site. so. There's pictures of it where it looks like China. They made it into Africa. Um, so it's been a, lot of, been a lot of places this place. 
Um, and in a changing world, what are we trying to get to? For me, I'm just trying to get to some native biodiversity and not a sea of weeds in your national park. So this is a, a project looking at perennial pepperweed, which is dominant in a lot of um, Central Valley and Northern California sites, but it's relatively uncommon in Southern California. Uh, we had a 10-acre infestation at this site, Paramount Ranch, and the cover within that infestation was almost all pepperweed. It increases erosion. Um, it's not very palatable to most plants. This is the site. This is where it's located. So what did we do? Uh, we didn't know what to do, so we just cut it down. That seemed like a pretty good beginning. Um, and there was um, a lot of information from the Nature Conservancy about treatments that they'd done that indicated that if you cut it down and let it regrow and then sprayed it with Roundup, that that was a pretty good part to, way to begin. Uh, so that's what we did. After that initial treatment, um, there was only 30% pepperweed left on the site. So we cut it all down again, and then we initiated this restoration experiment. Um, this, so this is what it looked like at the time. So amazing, a lot of mowed down ground. So the experiment was we started with one acre to try and understand what should we do with the rest of the 10 acres. Um, then the question was, um, will we hit upon one or two species that will compete really well, or will a more species-rich mixture be more successful? So we did all this crazy stuff where we plaskied out all the, all the soil to control for digging, and then we had these different treatments, shrub monocultures, grass monocultures, a five-species mix, and a ten-species mix. Um, these are the plants that we used based on what we had at the nursery at the time, what seemed to be competitive with other things, and what we could grow. Um, so the grasses were deer grass and um, purple needle grass, and the shrub monocultures were California sagebrush, California rose, and um, bush mallow. And then we had these two different um, five species mixes and ten species mixes that also involved vines and a variety of growth forms. This is what it looks like to dig out these plots. These are the plants. We planted them and then saw, waited to see what happened. Um, so this is uh, the first um, six months after treatment. So this is a control plot. All that stuff's pepperweed. Um, this is a 10 species mix plot where there's no pepperweed actually in the plot. Um, this is the survey results initially. So on the left is the cover of non-native species in the control where we did nothing beyond the initial cutting and spraying. Um, the plots where we dug up all the soil and then we just put it back. The monocultures, the five species mix, and the ten species mix. So what you see is that the non-native, the invasive cover is lowest in the highest diversity plots. And similarly, there's more variability in the percent cover native species, but higher um, diversity plots had more native cover. The only, the, one of the things that happened is that um, Pepperweed did not like being dug up because it has a, comes back from the rhizome, and this is the, in the, um, the cover of pepperweed, but that digging actually stimulated a bunch of other invasives to germinate. So that's why the control techniques, no matter what you do, you're getting some weed there. Um, but the 10 species mix um, did really well at suppressing other weeds. Uh, this plot project continued, and we, when we surveyed five years later, the same trends are, are still in those plots. So, for us, there's nothing native in that seed bank. When we didn't plant anything, all we got were weeds. Um, the control techniques, the one, things that were good at getting rid of pepperweed just stimulated other weeds. So the only way to get back to native cover was this really intensive planting and this hot, really high diversity, 10 species per square meter, um, was the most successful. But what happened, so we did this in our one acre area, but it was way too much work to like dig out ten, eight, the remaining nine acres. Um, and what happened in the rest was that from pepperweed, it went to Italian thistle, from Italian thistle, it went to yellow star thistle. So now there we are planting the remaining nine acres to try and get it back to being something better. The one nice thing about um, shrublands is if you think tropical forests grow fast, you know, the shrublands, they grow really fast. Um, and we see similar things where once you have canopy closure, those systems are fairly stable to non-native invasion. 
Um, the next example is about Penikita lioni, which is this little tiny, we call it lion's pygmy daisy. Uh, it grows in openings in coastal sage scrub. A lot of our coastal sage scrub, potentially because of nitrogen deposition, has a lot of annual grass invasion between the shrubs, which is where this plant would occur. Um, a bunch, it's in large scale decline. A lot of the populations are extirpated and it's federally listed. So we did a couple different kinds of experiments. Um, we did a community experiment where we removed by hand, um, with the help of criminals and interns, all the non-natives within each little area. Um, and then there was an, a, a hypothesis that it likes soil crust and that um, all the leaf litter from the grass was killing the soil crust. So then we tried two other treatments, one where we scraped off all the leaf litter but left it alone, and one where we actually scraped the leaf litter and, and imported pieces of crust um, from an adjacent area. And then we also did individual experiments where we looked at individual plants and removed competitors and left them with competitors and looked at the results. So what did we find? In the population, the community treatment, um, there wasn't a difference. There, none of the treatments had any effect on Penikita numbers. So none of them were good at increasing the population size of Penikita. Um, there was cutting alone, along with all the other treatments, had a small increase in the native species richness, the other little plants that grow with Penikita. But when you look at individual experiments, you see a strong effect of the non-natives on flower production and seed production on the target species. So these are the individual where we had um, plants, the number of flowers is on the left side, uh, and the, the design's the same for each one, control where all the weeds are in place versus neighbors removed um, for, I think it was um, one meter radius around each one. So. This is, these all show that the plant's being impacted. It's an annual, so seeds, flowers equals seeds equals the future of the species. Um, it's being impacted by these weeds. So we also compared extant and extirpated sites. And what we found is that all the sites where the species has been extirpated have tons of leaf litter and a lot of annual grass cover. They also, this is, um, uh, Another result, um, multi-dimensional scaling, where we looked at a bunch of features. And we also found that extirpated sites, again, had a lot of litter and annual grasses. They also had a high fire frequency um, and deeper soils. So what do we conclude from all this? Well, the non-natives are clearly having an impact on the plant, but that isn't the only thing limiting where you get it to grow. Um, because the community level experiment didn't show any increase from removing the competitor. What, what we've also done, it's too much work to go around and clip all the little individual grasses. So instead, um, what we've moved to now is actually looking for really high quality sites where there isn't non-native grass and there's a lot of their compatriot plants and doing um, reintroductions, putting seed back in those places, and that has been successful, as well as monitoring the existing populations. Um, the last example I want to give is from Cheeseboro Canyon, which is a non-native annual grassland, which I think is a habitat that many of us have come to peace with as being part of California and having some ecological functionality. Um, in this particular place, our fire ecologist is ex obsessed with getting um, native grass and bulbs back into this area. Uh, the other main driver behind this whole thing is that um, we had a big fire program, and when you have a big fire program, you either have to light things on fire or um, cut things down. You know, there has to be something for those people to do. Uh, and so when I started, we were still in the mode of lighting things on fire and trying to find um, the place that you could light on fire with the least amount of negative impact. Um, and so that was Cheeseboro Canyon. So the initial idea was to try and use a spring fire to get rid of non-native grass and hope for some miraculous native recovery. Um, this is, the landscape has, the oaks are in decline. There's not a huge um, native component within the non-native annual grassland. Uh, a lot of the streams are down cut like Phil was talking about. Um, and we don't really know what the historic distribution of plants here was. 
So we lit it on fire, and many of you may be able to guess the result. Um, oh, so it did kill the grass, um, but we got a lot of erodium, and what we really got was double overhead mustard. So um, you, there's a lot. Those are alternating stable systems for a lot of areas in California between mustard and non-native grass. So clearly that wasn't a solution. But because um, Marty is so um, invested in this site and because we're the Park Service and we never give up, we did like 50 million experiments at this site. Not really, but there's literally eight masters and a postdoc that have all happened here, usually small scale stuff. We solarized. That's, I picked this picture because you can see like four of the different experiments. So in, this is a solarization plot. Um, down low, there's a purple needle grass plot. To the left is a coastal sage plot. And then the two paired ones down low are um, looking at different herbivore impacts. So they, we built all these cages that had different sized holes that allowed in different um, seed predators and grazers. So we kind of thought, wow, we've learned so much. Oh, we also did these really cool experiments looking at the soil and beneficial bacteria in the soil and methanol treatments to increase beneficial bacteria. Um, and wow, we really knew a lot about this place, and we were pretty excited about that. And then it burned up in 2005, um, and we thought, okay, this is a perfect opportunity to put in place all this learning. We know, um, yes, some things get eaten, but um, if we can apply methanol and, see, and control the weeds and seed with native grass, it'll be wildly successful. So um, we, this is what it looked like right after the fire. Areas look like. Of course, they're double overhead mustard. Uh, we test planted a third of an acre with um, nacella in cage plots or stipa. Now we're back to stipa, and then we harvested the seed. We grew it to S. We gave it to S and S. They grew it out, and we. Um, this is preparing. So here's our test plots where we're growing the seed, and then this is herbicide to get, control the weeds because we know in our area that. Um, Stipa will not outcompete mustard or annual grass from seed. And then we drill seeded 26 acres after the herbicide treatment. So this is the environment that they got seeded into. It's pretty open. It's all looking good. It rained. It just got hammered by gophers. And in all of the experiments that we did up till then, 10 years of experiments, all these cages, we never had a gopher problem. Never. But when you when you scale up like that, we totally change the environment, right? There's no cover, there's not, um, there's no mustard, there's no grass. So you've eliminated all the above ground rooms. There's no ground squirrels there anymore, and the gophers just went hog wild. So um, scaling up can be very problematic. It really changes what you're dealing with. Not to mention that so many of the things I've tested you could never do on a large scale, and I'm not the only one. Like, who? Anyway, we've. We've all done those experiments where you apply like five pounds of sugar to your plot to see what happens. We're really not going to do that on a landscape scale. So to wrap up, um, are the constraints that we are all currently facing technical? Yes, I think many of them are. I don't know how to get in a cell of grassland back on 26 acres and not have it all eaten by gophers. If you do, I'd love to hear about it. Um, so we are really limited by techniques that work on a large scale. There's a lot of criminals in LA, and I use a lot of them to do tons of hand weeding, and we're still not making massive amounts of progress on an annual basis. Um, I think we are also very confused about what kind of techniques to use as the climate changes. Are the constraints financial? Yes, and my con financial constraints have nothing to do with big business or all the m amazing work that um, Bruce and others are doing. To me, it's just expensive to, to harvest seed, to grow it out, to grow plants, to get water, to control invasives. All those things cost money. Are they psychological? I think they are. I think we're afraid of not succeeding. We want to be perfect. Um, we don't dream big enough. We don't think about what do we already have, what can we let go, um, and what can we do differently. So the challenges of urban restoration for us are many. There aren't very many reference sites, although we no longer really care. We've moved beyond that. Um, there's lots and lots of people. 
that trample things and pull up your flags and get mad when you mess with their, when you cut down their eucalyptus trees and that plant vinca and do all sorts of annoying stuff. Um, there's lots of edge and all that edge means weeds, that means anticoagulant rodenticides, that means um, all sorts of issues, potential impacts of pollinators. Uh, there's lots of vectors, moving invasive plants around, people, bikes, animals. Uh, the Mediterranean ecosystem, our Mediterranean ecosystem, has a lot of natural disturbance already. Our, our entire park burns down every 30 years, um, not to mention all the grading and fossorial mammals and landslips. And then California, the rainfall, I mean, who needs to say more? Sometimes it doesn't happen, and then it happens a ton, but not at the time you want it to. Um, and without the rain, the plants won't grow. But all those challenges are op also opportunities. To me, the fact, um, when Bruce said that restoration is a relationship that's mutually beneficial for people and nature, I think that is the key. The more we can harness people's energy towards good ends, towards helping us, whether that's collecting seed, planting plants, writing letters, whatever it is, those people can help us. So lots of people means lots of labor. It means lots of inspiration and lots of eyes, feet, and hands. And this is an app that we use to have people re report invasive species. Um, we have a lot of citizen science efforts ongoing that I think are going to help. Um, lots of edge means you never have to carry anything very far. Um, and it's pretty easy to see most of the mountains. And lots of disturbance could be to our benefit if we could only figure out how to make it work for us instead of against us. So in conclusion, I think we should be hopeful. Uh, restoration is a field in its infancy and has so much potential and is a thing where people can actually feel good about their relationship to the environment, which is critical. So much of what we tell people is all about how bad we are and how bad everything you do is for the environment. And that's really depressing and it's not very fun and it doesn't get people inspired and it's only going to get us so far. It's so much more fun to say, hey, come out and plant these shrubs. And when you come back in a year, there'll be fruit and there'll be birds in there. And if you come back in two years, we can go catch all the lizards that are living in there. And how cool is that? Um, and I think we are not where we've figured it all out. And that's what makes it interesting. And we can do better and we can be better at it by talking to each other by um, looking across ecosystems, by setting up templates, by not being so picky about what it has to be, by being more practical. Um, I initially had don't be cocky um, as the third thing, but in better way, let's be humble in the face of complexity. I think we can get that feeling of like, oh yeah, we know how to restore a wetland, and then they're all duck ghettos, and that's not getting us anywhere either. Um, and I do think, I'm all, we need to scale up and we need to be more effective and more efficient, but I also think in areas with lots of people that are urbanized, a lot of these small scale restoration efforts are really important and they serve a huge function both for people and for nature. The, the plants and the animals and the birds and the insects and the kids, it's all appreciated by them. So sometimes we get in this debate in conservation and restoration where if it's not big and amazing, then let's not bother doing it at all. And I don't want us to fall into that trap. Um, Restoration is important wherever you can do it at whatever scale. And that's all. And later will be questions, not now.